Brothers, One Way to Puerto Vallarta. That's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching Macau Now. I'm Lia Yades. And now, a workshop of the McAllen City Commission. All workshops are open to the public in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. These workshops allow for detailed staff presentations. And so we're going to hold off the questions to staff until after we get a quorum, but before that we can do... 
So uh, one of the requests from the City Commission was to give you an update on what we were able to complete here in the last year due to all of the issues we've been dealing with, uh, including what we use, or what we submitted to the county. Although we weren't uh, reimbursed, we're still hopeful that that's, uh, actually we're pretty confident that it's, it's reimbursable to the City of McAllen. Robert? Yes, sir. Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. Williams, thank you for having me. Um, quick update, um, give you an overview of what we did. Uh, Wi-Fi, we, we approached the Wi-Fi project to install Wi-Fi in underserved neighborhoods um, or neighborhoods that couldn't get internet. Um, implementation took about 76 days. We spent about 3.1 million um, and we targeted Wi-Fi areas utilizing the light poles. Uh, we covered about 16,058 homes out of 37,000 addressable homes in the valley, or in McAllen, I should say, and we covered about 43% of the homes <coughs> in McAllen. Um, I broke it down, give you a little breakdown by district. Uh, this shows you the, there's 30,000 homes in our districts that are under 150,000 150, or under in value. Uh, we covered right around 15,900 of those homes, about 52%. And those are residential addresses with a property values 150,000 or less. So our initial target was looking at the household median income of the census data, which was, we started at 30,000, we increased it to 40, to 50, to 60,000. And then one, once we passed the 70,000, then we started looking at the value of the homes. Um, the census data just was a little outdated, so we started looking at the homes. Um, on average, our Wi-Fi right now, we, we have about 13,500 devices or users uh, per day right now. We started, when we first started, oh, even two, three months ago, we only had 3,500, 4,000 users a day. Uh, now we're averaging about 13,500 a day. So it's really it's really increased quite a bit. Um, I was hoping to get some success, success stories. Um, I didn't get any, I heard, uh, Dr. Gonzalez at our TML mentioned that um, uh, his comment was that remote learning was suffering in the beginning and after we installed Wi-Fi, it really helped uh, to get uh, participation from the kids that couldn't do remote learning. Um, we have, in McAllen, uh, we identified, we had been working with the school district and the school district identified 18,204 students, underserved students that needed, wi that needed internet at home. Uh, of those, we were able to cover 10,453 of those students, roughly right around 57% of the students that did not have internet, we were able to target and, and get them internet access. Um, uh, I have those, I was gonna show you that on the next slide. Um, actually, let me go back one slide, right here. Uh, if I go down, let me open up this map. Hopefully it's uh, the, the, it's either it's either the uh, type of poll that they have, and I can show you those. Um, I can go back and answer, uh, actually, let me address this, I'll show you the, the types. So here, here's a map, it kind of gives you an overview of, of our city, the, the, sh the dark shaded area is our city of McAllen, and then uh, the blue dots are all the Wi-Fi that the city we installed, the green dots on top are what the county installed. Um, if I was to overlay that, you can see all the blue dots, that's all our coverage. If I was to overlay that with where the 18,000 students reside, those are the black dots. Kind of hard to see on this screen. It's actually, for some reason, <coughs> the color's better on that one. But if I zoom in, you can kind of see the areas where there's students that we're not targeting, and the majority of them are in District 2. Yeah, District 2 was, uh, was if, I, if I go back to the, um, um, District 2 had the least amount of of, of Wi-Fi install. And, and the reason for that was really the type of poles that you all, uh, that District 2 has. Was, I wasn't picking on commissioners on what I was just, um, we were approved in the beginning for wood poles. Right. Uh, and for some, and for, for District 2, majority of their poles 
um, look, look like these. They're, those are the concrete poles, and we didn't have approval in the beginning. <coughs> it wasn't until the very, very end of the project that with Roy and Mayor's help, we were able to get AEP to approve to allow us to install on these poles. But by that time, we were already, I think we only had maybe 100 poles left, and we already had them allocated for other subdivisions. Are those the metal poles that they say they weren't going to be able to work on? Uh, no, the, the metal poles that we cannot install on are the, they're, they're galvanized, I, I call them steel, okay. but they're galvanized poles, and they look like these. Oh, okay. And, and there, these are also in District 2 that we cannot install on, and they're all uh, south of 2nd Street, south of the freeway, there's a lot of areas, uh, Mr. Veda identified some, some in your area, that they just cannot hold the... Uh, the, the weight and, and the, the wind resistance, the load. So, um, what, what kind of, because the power source, that we have to have a power source. So, what would it cost for us to put a pole there, our own pole there, that, that could support the high tide? I, I reached out, actually, it was, it was in passing with engineering. We talked about poles, installing our own poles. We have to have them certified, insured. Uh, get electricity to them. I didn't get a cost. All I heard, what I what I understood was it was very, it was expensive, and it, it wasn't really something that engineering didn't think that we should be doing. Um, I didn't get that in writing. I didn't, you know, I really didn't sit down with Evet and and pinpoint certain areas. Uh, we can definitely do that. I mean, could you put it right next to it where you support the? the light pole actually is more of a support than it's independent um, pole for it and still use that for that or no? I, 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 I just need a vertical structure, Mayor, something that can support the wind resistance from the equipment and the weight. I do not know all the details of the right-of-way and, and putting two poles right next to each other. I, I really not right-of-way. Yeah. Or, or feeding off of, I don't know, if it, even if AP would let us feed off the power of one pole into another pole right next to it. I'd have to, you know, get with them as well. Get a design. Well, we're doing that now, though. I mean, we're feeding off the power into the light pole anyway. So yeah, we're we're doing that through the photo cells. the same feed, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, we're we're doing we're doing that through the photo cells. Why don't you set up a meeting with AP and see if we can do that? Because that's an easier easier solution than trying to figure out how to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So. Uh, speaking of Wi-Fi expansion, we're, we're trying to utilize our asset as much as we can. Um, we, we started taking our, our traffic intersections. I think there was a bond for our uh, fiber to the traffic or, or actually getting connectivity to the intersections. So what we're doing is we're deploying Wi-Fi to these intersections. Uh, we've already completed 37 out of the 97 in the past two and a half weeks. So it's progressing very quickly. Uh, we're on schedule hopefully to be completed by July. Uh, weather permitting and equipment, but uh, if not, we'll, you know, I, I wouldn't foresee that we'd be past a month after that. Uh, and that would be connecting the last of the, the 97 uh, traffic intersections. You know, the benefits of it is we can manage the intersections, uh, we can do remote maintenance, we get alerts when they're down, uh, and we're able to uh, do timing and synchronization uh, by use, utilizing um, our, our Centrax software. So, in addition, one of the benefits by getting the intersection connected is we're able to put cameras at the intersection. Uh, and we already have, uh, I'll show you a map right here, all the ones on the left in light green and dark green are, are intersections uh, that are now connected either on Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi either light, light, lime green, uh, the dark green are connected on fiber. Um, I had a question. One of the problems we have now is we do cutler, which re requires us to pay more frequently than, say, state man roads, right? And so every time we do a cutler, we have to re-cut the fencers at the right turn lane. If we oh, got yeah. fiber out there, can't we do it by motion detector or something? Or you, is there a way to perfect that? Whether fiber or Wi-Fi, it. it the network connectivity is there. It just depends on the uh, the feature or the functionality of the traffic controller and the software. Um, I would have to let traffic speak to that. I, I'm not that familiar with the traffic controller equipment and whether it has that capability or not. Um, but if it does and it has network connectivity,
the, the life expectancy of Wi-Fi? Is that what? Um, yeah. um, life expectancy, we're projecting about eight years. Well, pretty much everything is at the is at the same right. age, stage of age. Okay. So whether we're going to, uh, I would definitely say depending on how much the sun is beating up the equipment, how often. I would imagine we're probably going to have to spend or, or replace majority of it, probably 80% of it at a certain time. And that's just a guesstimate because it was all deployed <coughs> at the same time. It's out in the sun all day, every day. So so at that point, are we going to start saving from now for the next eight years? Are we going to write a grant? Are we going to... Uh, the initial proposal included um, like a depreciation fund, but okay. I think it was uh, the city commission... Uh, decided not to and that they would address it at that time. Very bold of you. <laughs> well, the technology might change too. And so well, yeah. that's right. We right. talked about that. Right. And, and it was actually Kevin Fagan, the one who, who's, who mentioned that, well, we don't know what technology is going to be like in eight, nine years. It might be something better. Right. Um, either, I mean, either way, I, we could put money away for whatever the technology replacement is yeah. or just wait and address it then. Okay. And it was a decision of this committee to, to address it then. Okay, so in District 2, as you said, the, the decision why um, not many devices were installed in the polls was because of the, <coughs> the, the, the substance or the material of the pole itself. Right. If it wasn't wood, it was concrete or the galvanized steel that you referred. Right. It was not uh, installed. Now, I, I know that there were several neighborhoods who probably had you know, the wooden pole structure and they were installed. Yes. So more likely than not, those neighborhoods actually did receive it. Yes, and I can. I have a different map I can show you. This pole right here is we call them the concrete pole. Um, they can support the weight. We did get approval. We have deployed on these type of poles. But you ran out of devices. We ran out of devices. Okay. Right. So we I, there, I believe identified seven additional neighborhoods in District Two right. that could uh, could benefit from you know or, or have these poles <coughs> that we could install Wi-Fi on. Can I ask you to forward that PowerPoint to my email? Sure. Uh, because I'm sure that I'll probably get some calls on that issue. Okay. Because I did receive an email back then a year ago about that. Yeah. And at least I would have some supporting data to explain why. Yep. Here's a here's a map by district. Um, on the left side, you'll 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 see that there's 30,000 homes we've installed, uh, 15,900 of those homes. But if I were set a set a filter for district two. You can see District 2 here, and the, the caps show where the, the students are at. Right. The bigger the cap, uh, you can see where the coverage is. We, we only have coverage in these areas. That's our Wi-Fi. But all these students out here uh, do not have coverage. Right. Is, yeah. Do we have enough? Um, is the water tower close enough to them so it's just a matter of the light poles that's an issue? Correct, sir. Yeah. yeah. We, as a matter of fact, tower. with the traffic project, we, uh, we added another water tower. Uh, with the, the capability to, to deploy Wi-Fi. So now it's really just getting the equipment to the poles. But some of the poles are ready. Yep. Some it's in use. Do yep. we have a cost, uh, how much how much we would be spending? Like sure. if, if uh, now that we know that we can install in those particular poles and in District 2 that they didn't uh, get enough, do we know uh, off of those subdivisions that you mentioned how many or how much of the uh, in, uh, equipment needs to be installed there and what the, what the price tag would be? Yeah, I think with installation, um, and this is just a guesstimate, we're probably looking at about 1,200 a pole. Uh, it might be less. Um, so about 1,200 a pole. Okay. And let's say we do 500 poles. Yeah. So uh, I don't think it's even, for seven neighborhoods in District 2, it, it's probably going to be around 300 poles, three, maybe 400. It's not too much. Yeah. We can definitely go get an exact count of how many poles, and, and I can get sure. an estimate and get a quote if it, that's it, the direction. You know, I know this is going to sound uh, antithetical, but you know, technology. with the technology evolving, uh, it would be a shame if the city decides to invest to put more Wi-Fi devices where in three or four years they may become obsolete in even five years, right? And I, I think I always believe in long-term investment, something that's going to be sustainable over a period of time. The only reason why we went through this whole project was because of COVID. You know, it was kind of reactionary to say, well, now we have 
distance remote learning for the students in their own households. And we try to make, with remedial measures as best we could with the school district, to address that issue. I, I, I never thought it was going to be something that was always permanent, mm -hmm. right? And it looks like we're kind of heading back towards the school. I mean, that's something that while work, it might be worthwhile if we have the extra funds to do it, I wouldn't think that it would be something necessarily pressing if, in fact, all the school districts were going to start heading back. Because we have to you know, go back in time. What was the whole intent for, for doing this whole project? If that issue or reason has well, been I think, it, I think it was a little more. It was 2014, way before COVID, because they, they gave these people the, hot, the iPads. Right. So homework started having to go from, and right. teacher responses and teacher information. More and more of the communication of the school way before COVID was right. starting to be done by the iPad. But the other thing, too, is not getting tested because my daughter received one. She, they have that uh, hotspot. The Wi Fi. Yeah. So yeah. using cellular signal, right? So, yeah. so there was really no need to even have Wi Fi. Assuming that the parent was one put on notice that this was available, and maybe I could pick it up and, and rent it out or whatever. Then yeah, and, and, and during COVID, I, I, I believe that you, the, the city commission, assisted the county with some monies to get the the MiFi's or the Verizon, uh, right. and I think they they issued out twenty thousand of them. So, so just because I'm showing you a map of students that we don't cover the area doesn't mean that they don't have it. Right. The school exactly. may have augmented our our Wi-Fi right. by giving yeah. them by yeah. giving them my right. 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 contract. Right. You don't want to be duplicating. No, their contracts, any, you know, it's an annual contract that costs them, I don't know, a good deal of money. I see. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah, I mean, I think the no, digital think divide is real, right? right? And it was real before COVID. Uh, it definitely helps level the playing field. I think like with anything else, we need to continue looking at the data. I think the reports you're producing are what we need to see over time. Yeah. Right. And so as school activity picks up, we'd like to see trends on how the activity on the Wi-Fi network is picking up. Eventually, we'd like to see all the reports on what type of activity is being done, right? Uh, because I think you can look at how many streaming services are being used, whether it's PlayStation, Netflix, yep. things of that nature. So if that starts to take up 80, 90% of our, of our Wi-Fi network, how much more do we want to invest and what do we want to expand to? And we always have to be cognizant of this type of technology, you know, really outpacing uh, sometimes the expense of it. Right. So but if the, if the idea, like the mayor said, is to just have citywide wi wi city wide Wi Fi, I, I understand that. But but again, do we want to invest millions of dollars in our current technology that may become obsolete? Yeah, no, and we don't want to compete with the private sector. Agreed. Right, exactly. So, yeah. No, I just, when you talk to the school district, they were looking at their budget because their annual cost for the hotspots is. Yeah, I, I can tell you, our, our cost for those Wi Fi's or the hotspots mm -hmm. uh, are, you know, about $48 a month. I don't know what the school is, but. Assuming that they get better rate than we do, or if not, worst case, you know, the same, and they have 10,000 of them times 48 a month, mm -hmm. that, that, that adds up quickly. Yeah. It adds up. Yeah. Their, right. their budget's pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. But it was before. Before, it was just more and more things were being done, especially homework yeah. uh, on Wi-Fi. So we had kids going and sitting out at Burger King outside yeah, schools. Was that was way before mm -hmm. COVID. The bottom one was what Commissioner Whitaker had asked, you know, Wi-Fi solutions for areas without available. And that's where we could either install city poles or or, uh, um, or we can do the other solution is what we call a single home connect connection. But uh, they pay for that, isn't that correct? Uh, I think this is what FAR, City of FAR, attempted to do. Uh -huh. And I think they had issues or, or I think maybe, maybe it worked, but they stopped and, and now they've kind of turned around and and well, their fiber. They, they had that, you were there at um, Region 12 meeting, they did the presentation. That was $32 million. Yeah. Well, well, this, this solution was Wi-Fi. It was basically putting, kind of like a direct TV, putting a dish on your house, right. penetrating, running a cable inside, and it provides Wi-Fi just for that one residential home. Right, but uh, that would be up to the homeowner to do that. Well, we're not going to take that task on, are we? Uh, we haven't. Yeah. Uh, one, it, it's a it's it's a maintenance nightmare. Uh, right. I think FAR has found that out because now you're supporting a device in their house. You have to penetrate in their house. You have liability. And they'll call you at all hours of the day, time of day. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> those are the only two, other than uh, fiber. But of course, fiber right. to the home is, is thank you very expensive. Um, and and I, I had one other thing. You're putting up street lights um, where we don't have them. We spent I don't know how many was it. 86. Are those suitable for the Wi-Fi units? In 
installing new street lights? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the street lights. Well, not, I'm not installing street lights. I sh yeah, that is. Oh, I'm asking her the question. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Marlene is. Are, that, are they suitable for putting these mods on top of them? Because a lot of them are in low income neighborhoods. Yeah, we have our street lights that we go through the house. Well, then you're going to answer that. Wait. You want to wait for me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let me, let me tell you a little bit about, I won't take up too much of your time, but your maintenance. Maintenance, we're getting probably two to three work order tickets a day or, or citizen calls. Um, we, on most cases, we're, we're able to resolve them within the same day. Uh, on average, it could be one to three days. Now, if we have a major equipment failure, it's taking three to five weeks. Um, so average time to diagnose, it, it, it takes us. My, my team about one to two hours to actually go get a bucket truck, get out there, go up to the top, try and diagnose the issue, and figure out what's wrong with it. So it takes about two hours uh, they, just just for one pole. But I would assume most of them you can remote access, right? This if, is if, it, this right, is if it's it, completely offline. Unless it's completely offline. And, and then the next one are root causes. The next one is where it says outages. Majority of our problem are power. The poles just have dirty power. It's not very... Uh, clean. So we're having, uh, the, you know, the little photo cells where we tap into, they burn out. When they burn out, we lose power to the equipment, we lose remote access. We have to get up there with a bucket truck, get on top, maintain them. Uh, we have a surge protector or, or a lightning arrestor. Uh, they burn out quite quite a bit because of the power fluctuations. Um, so we burn those out. We got to get on the bucket truck and get up and replace them. Would have been a much better design if we would have put something towards the bottom where we could have just gotten a ladder, one person, get up there, replace it. But we mounted everything so high, lessons learned. Um, you know, uh, pole replacements is another one. AEP will get out there or Magic Valley, they'll replace a pole, they'll service a pole, and now our, they either take our equipment off and we have to go put it back on, or they move the equipment and now it's not getting connectivity, so we have to go out there and service it. Those are our biggest biggest one and power is probably 90% of our problem uh, support obstacles when I mentioned uh, you know limited access to bucket trucks um, you know we we work very closely with traffic which I have to you know compliment they've been awesome helping us uh, we have to borrow a bucket truck and, and if a bucket truck is down we had one that was down for three weeks getting maintenance repairs on it um, you know staffing as well it takes two people to get out there and, and maintain like I said to get up there uh, one on the bottom of the bucket truck and one on top. Um, we are, I am working with Jeff Johnson on doing a comparison. Is it, you know, before we go ask for uh, a resource, another resource or another, or ask for a bucket truck just for IT, you know, what's the comparison to outsource the maintenance and have Come someone on, just service Robert. the poles? So we're looking at both of them, we're looking at all options. Um, ongoing spend. Initially, I projected we were going to spend around 319,000 a year for maintenance. Um, right now, we're on target to be about 19,000 under budget for the year. Uh, we would have been about 70,000 under budget this year, but AEP requires the first payment is current year and one year up front. So I have to pay two years. Uh, and even after paying those two years for the poll rentals of AEP, we're still going to be projected as right now about 19,000 under budget. Um, so next year, hopefully, we'll be able to, you know, if, if things go well, we'll be able to reduce the, the amount that we're requesting for budget for maintenance. Questions? I asked Jenny. Oh, I mean, just like JJ, would you send me the, the yep. slides? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Yes, all of Thank you, Robert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Does anybody have any questions for the agenda before uh, the meeting so staff can answer them? Yes, sir. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay. Uh, street light project. The short answer to your question there is yes, the Pope will be able to support the, the light project. Okay. There's 86 more. <laughs> in, the, in the neighborhood you need, right? Yeah. Okay. Our going to be doing a presentation for um, the status of the original Wi-Fi project and um, the upcoming projects. Sorry, not Wi-Fi, streetlights. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commission. Uh, this is a, a presentation just to give an update on the streetlight project we've been working on over the last year. Right. They're expensive too. Yeah. Uh, for this, for, for this um, last survey that we did, we looked mostly at the south, uh, south part of McAllen between Taylor Road and 10th Street and then the expressway south to Military Highway. We did focus on residential areas. Um, mostly we, we didn't include any of the industrial areas because most of the time when they go through the development, you know, we make sure we enforce the street lighting requirements at that time. Um, a lot of the residential areas, especially uh, Survey 5 and Survey 6, those d were developed back in 1962. And so uh, the requirements for street lighting were a lot less stringent. And so the lighting is a lot more spaced. And we went in there uh, with the new street lighting requirements and installed uh, new street lights. And um, this was a breakdown. A uh, total of uh, 86 street lights were installed. Uh, we broke it down into the six areas and I went over the limits for the study. And then um, in, the, in the little table, you'll see that all the areas have been completed with the exception of one street light that we're pending. Uh, AEP had a couple of issues on that street light, so they're, they're gonna let us know when, when it's complete. Uh, another section that wasn't added to this table was a, a separate request we made with AEP. Um, and the reason why it was kind of separate from this table was because it was gonna be paid for with CDBG funds. And so we're still trying to go through the design uh, to make sure that we have the sufficient number of lights to get lighting along 23rd Street. Um, and that was um, in uh, survey area five. And uh, it's a kind of like a bold yellow line that you'll see there. I, I had a question, like on, on my street, they're, they're not efficient because they got oak trees all over them, so you can't see anything unless you're right underneath the tr light. Is that, are you doing something like that when you're putting them in, or I mean, are you trying to correct that problem? Uh, it, it, it's a little difficult to, to uh, kind of solve because a lot of people, they don't want to trim their trees, but we do bring it up to AEP and we let them know. And sometimes they'll say, well, you need to get the property owner to do the work, or sometimes they'll do it, or at least that's what we've seen. Um, uh, the thing that we focus most on is the spacing, and we also look at the wattage. Uh, we have different wattages with high pressure sodium, and we try to match them with LED. Uh, is that the difference in cost? I noticed, I noticed they're pretty significant. Just like in Survey Two, you had five for nine thousand, and the other one you did fourteen for um, thirteen thousand. Kind of a difference in price. The, the, the difference in cost uh, sometimes stems from new installations versus putting a light on an existing pole. Oh. So sometimes the poles are there, we just put a light, and so it might be cheaper to do more lights uh, mm -hmm. versus doing um, a, a small amount of lights, but they're all new installations, and so that's where the cost difference comes from. Uh, like in Survey 6, we did uh, 15 new lights, but all those were on existing poles, so AEP said that they would not be charging us for that. <coughs> That's where the cost difference came from. So the next uh, area that we wanna focus on is uh, between Taylor Road all the way up to 23rd Street and then Nolana going south to uh, Business 83. We've break, broken them uh, down into four areas and we've also selected a timeline in the next uh, in the next slide, um, again, residential areas and uh, that we're focusing on and, and you'll see on here the uh, timeline for that. Once we finish with submitting all our uh, requests to AP after we've reviewed cost and we, we wanna proceed with that, well, then we'll begin on the next district so that we can kind of keep going or next area. Mm -hmm. um, is the intent to just do that and continue district by district? Yes, okay. or, or areas too. Okay. We, we want to focus mostly on the older areas that mm -hmm. don't have the space right. the or is the lighting that is required now uh, through new development.
Yes. Are we so, accounting for those as well? Uh, not in not in this uh, presentation. We do have a separate, uh, I guess, project. We're or not project. It's more like a maintenance that we're trying to do okay. twice a year, where we go out and we just look at existing streetlights and then we determine the condition. Is it dim? So we report it to AEP as dim. Um, is it completely out? So we report it as out. Uh, Actually, you, uh, Yvette asked me for some information on, on, on the street light surveys that we've done just to kind of check the status of how that light is working. And it's all slowly decreased. So we started off with like 400 reported uh, one year, then, then the next, we're trying to do it every six months. So the next six months it was like 300, now we're down to 200. Um, so yes, we take care of that, but with a separate uh, event that we do twice a year where we just look at that. Yeah, because like in the areas, like in the, like La Balboa and Hermosa where we did replace some lights, some areas are still dark, but it's because the, the lighting is dim. Mm -hmm. um, I did go around and not a lot of, some were due to the trees, mm -hmm. uh, but most of them were because they were dim. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, okay. Yeah. So that's a separate survey. Yes. Uh, that's something we do separately, but also to throughout the year we take phone calls from people who report a, a dim light or a street light that's out, and so we'll take care of it right then and there. We don't wait for the for the an, or biannual survey that we do on street lights. Okay. Any other questions? So when you're reporting a dim light, isn't it going to either AEP or I guess in the case we're going to do United Valley? Because we ourselves don't do that. We don't. We right. just report it. We, just we report it to on. AEP or Magic Valley, whatever entity the light bulb or the street light belongs to. And what's the, so how long does it take from what, from the moment that you guys report it to AEP? How long does it take for them to fix it? Um, it, it, it depends. Uh, I know like when the hurricane hit, they, it, t it, it was taking a long time, but uh, recently, I want to say maybe about a week on average um, to, to fix a light. Sounds about right. Mm -hmm. On average. That's not been my experience. But, by the way, it, <laughs> but me neither. That's what I was asking because I was like, oh. <laughs> that's because I went to the website, put the poll number, put the address, like the block number, and it still took over Is that a recent? Two or three months. Is that a recent deal? To you fix your uh, light? It was about, uh, yeah, well, January, February. Really? January, to fix your light, really? Not my light. It was a street light on Buddy Owens. Oh. Yeah. So there, there are some uh, issues that AEP runs into where they don't fix it within. They're they're supposed to fix it within three days. That's that's what we have um, under our maintenance contract with them. Oh, wow. um, and if you recall, they uh, gave us a credit the last time that this happened, yes. and so. They do keep track of that, and they do track, um, and we can follow up with them again on, on where we are as far as those credits. But sometimes, if it's not just a bulb out issue, there are they are allowed more time. So if it has something to do with a wiring, or if it has something else other than just a straight uh, bulb replacement, um, those three days don't apply. So it just depends. And then uh, recently, we have uh, noticed because of the weather that that has been going on, it it does take them a little bit more time. Yeah. Yeah, the public utility has jurisdiction over it. They have to do that or you get credit against it, but you have to hire lawyers to do all that. So. You know, it's one thing if it's like in the middle of the street and you've got a row between one major intersection and the other, let's see you've got 10 lights, and it's just it's one in the middle. It's no big deal. But like as, as, as I've learned, especially on intersections where you kind of uh, turn the light at an angle, where it's actually kind of pointing towards the middle of the intersection as opposed to being perpendicular to the intersection, um, that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. A big difference. By, by the way, unrelated, but related, sort of, since we can't annex anymore, we're getting surrounded by subdivisions now. You won't, you won't see those too much, but it's supposed to be report. The policy there now is they're requiring the developer to put up um, street lights, pay for the street lights, and pay one year's um, amount of the street lighting bill. And after that, it's up to whoever. <laughs> the county's not going to pay for it. Because right. they don't want to start, they have 300,000 people out street lights. They're right. not going to start with new subdivisions doing it. So, does the homeowner what a mess that's going to be. So they're going to put them up and eventually they'll just turn off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to pay for them. They're not going to turn off. Suppose there's homeowners, well, suppose there's homeowner associations. If I talk to two of them, they don't, they're, they're, their homeowner associations won't exist. So, and that's, that's going to be our problem. So then what's going to happen? Well, 
I mean, someday when the legislature gets sent for sense again, we'll probably annex those properties because well, it can be such a mess. Right now, the county for um, <laughs> for brush collection, they still don't have garbage collection. Brush collection, they're going to add it to the the bill is to add it to your abalone tax bill, but you can't foreclose if somebody doesn't pay that portion of your abalone tax bill. So the city's going to have to take it. Huh? The city's going to take it. Now, can we do a? Uh, um, because I know that you can do it through the 311 app. You can do the whole reporting for the lights. I was wondering if we can do like a little how-to report uh, your street light off on, um, on, so we can put on Facebook and probably get like a um, social team to help you guys out. Uh, so that way they can do like a full, uh, like an outreach. Like, hey, and not just be like, you can report it on 311. You know, actually have a video where like step-by-step -step, uh, we're showing people how to report the light. Because it's not that hard. Uh, but I think for some people, you know, just, just the fact that send a picture, submit it, that's hard enough. But I think we do like a little video, like a how to report your street light. Um, and then that way we can all, we can circulate it, not just in our, in our pages, but also like in all the departments. So hopefully we can get more people um, reporting their lights out. So I thought, I thought you could do a 311, you take a picture of yeah. a light and it has a number on it and send yeah. in the 311 and that gets reported to. Yeah, yeah. so we'll do just like a how-to video. So let's say like, a, uh, like grab your phone, go to a 311 app, and oh. then you're going to apply here, take the photo, submit it, and then boom, and there you go. And, and then there we put like, hey, uh, your light might be fixed within the next two to three days if you do it this way. So that way we can kind of like gear it up so we can start educating people as to how to report it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on the street light report? Thank Actually, you very much. Uh -huh. work. <laughs> I just call the lights on. Okay, and next one is a uh, project status report. You got you just move over to chair and. Uh, Scoot on. <laughs> Let me see if I can get some help on getting it. Ah, oh, yes. So watch out for you. We missed him today, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, we shouldn't say that out loud. So this is our project status report through the end of April 2021. See if I can get this going. There we go. Bicentennial Boulevard construction uh, project continues. Uh, Texas Cordy is a contractor and they continue to make progress. They are almost done with all the utility work. Um, there's uh, essentially basically a couple of structures for storm. Um, they're near completion with the um, Irrigation District 1 and 3 uh, raw water lines, and they continue to do the paving work on the various segments of the project. The next project that we have is a, a 2018 bond drainage improvement project for 43rd Street uh, Stormwater Bypass. Paso Construction is the contractor. Uh, they are prepping for uh, paving a portion of it, and they also continue with installation of that storm line. We also have... What's uh, the uh, end date on that one? What? Next week. August. Sorry. Um, this is behind schedule. The original date was August. There was a uh, delay with utility relocations with AEP. And so um, we're working with them to finish just as soon as possible. As I mentioned, they're, they're getting ready to pave, and they may have even started the paving operations. Okay. So they're finished. almost... They could be almost done? I mean, yes, in the sir. next 30 days? Yes, sir. Okay, oh, great. wow. That's ahead of... No, this is no, 2020. 2020. Uh, 2020. Last year. <laughs> yes, yes. Wow. They've been, they, they are behind yeah, schedule because they were, they were waiting for that relocation. I I okay. The Dove Avenue construction uh, project is from 2nd to, to 10th Street, contractors RDH. They are near the intersection of Dove um, already, and um, we are uh, programming uh, part of that work for this week. Um, so that they can go ahead and finish that installation of that storm line and start that paving work. Uh, North 4th and Sunflower, this is actually construction that's along uh, Quamesha, and it's uh, crossing 2nd Street this week as well. It's doing that right now, right? Is it started? We are going to be uh, issuing a notice. We may have already issued that notice, I think, um, earlier today for the closure of, of 2nd Street so they can complete that crossing. Are, are those really big boxes, right? I saw them out there, right? Uh, these are uh, huge. Uh, 
Yes, the storm huge. insulation is yeah. what, yes. So what's, what area is that draining? I just wondered. What, so what there is, is to the west of 2nd Street, um, there's, uh, it doesn't quite go to Sunflower Shasta. There's a, a street um, just south, north of Comesha, and we're picking up that storm line. It's not, the infrastructure isn't going into the neighborhood, but we're picking up that storm line at the outfall there at 2nd Street to give them additional capacity for when that rains to help drain that. It's also um, alleviating the existing storm line was uh, siphoning under the um, uh, irrigation line along 2nd Street. And so this project alleviates that with a, a storm line that doesn't have to do that siphon. So wow. it's going to be additional capacity to drain uh, that neighborhood, that area. And that is one that uh, floods pretty regularly with almost any, any rain event that we have. Uh, Northwest Blue Line uh, regrade, uh, trench into outfall, Reem is the contractor. They are commencing with a storm line going north on 33rd Street this week. And they um, have indicated to us that they're going to work, um, I'm not going to say it's not around the clock, but they're going to be working extended hours uh, to get that storm line up to uh, Cornell Avenue. They're aiming, uh, weather permitting, uh, by next week to have that uh, storm infrastructure installed to Cornell Avenue. They will still have additional work to do to cover it and backfill and do all the connections, but essentially we're looking at next week for a substantial completion of that storm line along 33rd Street. On this same project, I understand that there was an additional study on the quote unquote Chinatown Park retention pond. Yes, sir. And also, uh, I guess, well, I'm not clear, maybe there was a, another study on retention area on the northwest blue line but south of Trenton as you uh, head south towards Robin. Yes. Sir. Is there an update or, or, or any report on that? The uh, consulting engineer uh, has given us some preliminary information on those areas already and so we're working with them on what those possible solutions are and putting together some cost estimates. Uh, they have some preliminary recommendations on, on what we can do so we're we've been um, in contact with them regularly, right. and so we're going over what those options are. It include, uh, includes that um, drainage ditch, ditch to the south of Trenton. It also includes to the north of Trenton right. along Auburn, um, whether we uh, can gain a benefit from excavating out um, some additional land area. It also included um, another outfall for the baseball uh, parks, another connection so that we can drain those ponds, and it included an evaluation of taking that storm system north of the baseball uh, park to the east right. to alle alleviate and reduce that drainage area as well. So there's various components that we've been working right. on, and um, we're uh, working with them to finalize. There was another issue, uh, because I like maps. So I pulled up the, the, the stormwater drainage uh, layout for Madison Park, which is basically Umbrella, Umbrella Bird, Toucan, and Burden. Well, not Burden, sorry, it's Toucan. But Umbrella Bird, Toucan, and along 26. I was a little surprised to see that there's only two outlets on Umbrella Bird, two outlets on Toucan, and then services one more. And then you have the main stormwater drain going down Toucan uh, and drains into that Northwest Blue Line. Mm -hmm. To me, it seems a little small. Not in terms of uh, inlets, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, this is from a completely non-engineering point of view perspective because I look at other subdivisions where they, you know, like Cornell. Cornell is actually a good example where they have four inlets on the street and then they have another two inlets on the north alley and another two inlets There's on the south alley. alley. And that subdivision is Cornell's smaller than the one on the road. Of course, mm -hmm. difference in time, difference, you know, in terms of zoning and the planning and all that different requirements. I understand that. But in terms of water drainage, it just seemed like it was insufficient to have only two inlets on Umbrella Bird, two inlets on Toucan, and then I think another two, inlet, two inlets on, on the other two inlets over. I don't so know, is that something that's part of the study? Yes, sir. It is. So that is something that we're evaluating. Um, what's interesting with that particular uh, subdivision is that the inlets on Umbrella Bird, the, the top of curb, um, is essentially really close to the high water uh, mark on the drain ditch. And so it's not wow. just an issue of additional uh, capacity, it's it's that hydraulic grade line that, that we need to look at. So even if, uh, my initial reaction, even if we do add additional inlets, 
that might not be the answer. So we're evaluating right. that to see what, what that best option is. Okay, I didn't think about that. Thanks. Um, we also have the Bicentennial Blue Line project from Harvey uh, to Tamarack. I have an update, or I have just two listed, but there are the four crossings that we're working on. Con construction continues on the La Vista Avenue Bridge, and um, when they complete with that one, they'll move to the pedestrian bridge at Highland, and then the subsequent uh, crossings. Sarah Avenue Storm Bypass uh, Drainage Improvements. This was a project that was awarded to Texas Cordia. This is the first of our drainage utility <laughs> fee projects that's under construction. And this actually has already been completed. And so this is our first drainage utility fee, fee project. Okay, why do, they call it, why do they call it a blue line project? Blue line? Yeah, why? Because it's draining away stormwater? Blue line on the map. Yes. <laughs> and water's blue, right? That, well, well, there original, you go. Original, <laughs> this one, the original is a blue line on the map. And, and when we were buying them up in the early 80s, we paid $7,000 an acre, no matter where it was in Mac Allen. Hmm. Bought, bought almost 100 acres at seven bucks, well, seven thousand an acre. The blue pipe. <laughs> My only regret is I didn't buy a whole bunch. Yeah, no. seven thousand. <laughs> yeah. Our next project is at 38th Street and Russell. This is the extension of 38th connection to Russell, and this has been completed as well. And our single machine um, repaving contract with Cutler continues. Uh, there were some streets that we're looking at adding, particularly on on Trenton, and a couple of other locations. So we're, we're evaluating those to see how much of that of those segments we can include. And then this is TxDOT's update on the I-2, I-69 interchange. Work continues with that and closures continue. Um, you may see some of those um, closures as, as they forward to us. Um, we put out those notices through MCN uh, to assist with that. When is that to be done? On two completed. Two it's about two more years. Two more years. Is that parallel ramps? It's going to be parallel ramps going from? You have like a rendering of their Expected final. I'll I'll get you that rendering. Um, I'll send it Very out with a Friday Oh, I know. Yeah, so every day. <laughs> they are. It's basically two additional flyovers, and so there's one coming in from the San Juan area that's going to be crossing, and then there's the other one closer to Jackson on the. North, the, 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 ori side. the original one that heads north is to, to remain. I, as I understand it, I think. Two are remaining, and they're coming in with two more. But I'll get you the layout just to confirm. Easy to see. Yes. And also, how far they go on I-2, because there's always a lot of questions about the construction and how far it is. Yes. Well, I know one, the landing one of the, the landings goes all the way to San Juan. And you can see yeah. some of that area that's closed off, and they already have, uh, they already drilled yeah, um, for some of that. So it goes it goes pretty far. Uh, the remark was there's going to be no exits for the city of fire. Really? Well, luckily, they don't have any businesses to worry about. <laughs> so, so show an so show an aerial event. So uh, show an aerial that goes all the way east of Madison. I'll, I'll bring it for the next update. We'll present an aerial. <laughs> yeah, he will. Unnecessary. Well, that's question, real quick. Only if you know right now, at the moment. Do we do, do we know why we're closing off Main Street? Why Texas is closing off the Main Street exit? Yeah, like right now, I just barely passed a truck that was putting up the barrels, and I went ahead of it and went to 58. So the last thing that they have to do, I think, I believe, is re resurfacing of the frontage roads. Um, I can give you an update on where they are with that. Okay, I was just wondering because it seemed like they've been doing it almost yeah. at the same time when coming yes. in from the meeting, and then like I got to go all the way to 23rd to yeah. take the next one. And then 23rd's closed. Well, it, it, it was earlier today. Oh, okay. Was it open right now? I didn't check because I, 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 I ignored the sign and took the entry exit anyway. <laughs> I admit it. I broke the law. Wow. And you're a prosecutor. I know. Can you imagine that? Oh my God. Thank you. Is it? God, God, please help our society if this is the person prosecuting us. Can I do it? Okay. Who's next? Who's next on the chat? Subdivision. Edward. Edward, ready? You have seven minutes. Yeah, sure. Fast. How much? Five. Oh, Edgar starts real fast. Don't let Joaquin talk about that. Oh, shut up. Yeah. Yeah, look. You already used your allotment of questions. Yes, I did. Study your maps. Love maps. Love maps. For that for. What do they love you? Well, I got Max Delore. Um, 
So this past uh, month in April, we had four new subdivisions, uh, three residential, one commercial, and then six recorded, uh, which bring in 151 new residential lots to the city. So that's always good. Uh, for the new subdivisions, first off, we have 4,700 where subdivision. That is a one lot um, apartment subdivision. It's on where uh, Buddy Owens in 34th. Change, maybe not. There we go. It's skipping. There we go. Next up is Chris Auto Service Subdivision. It's a one lot uh, commercial on Warbler and 23rd, just a little bit over half an acre. Uh, this one's a replat of Paseo de Lago Subdivision. It's going to be townhomes, and there's going to be 15 lots, uh, just over three acres. This is on Orangewood and Jackson. And lastly, we have the Soto del Valle. This is in the ETJ. It will be 10 lots of single family, um, uh, just Road. under six and a half acres Valley? on Ruth. Orange Road and Jackson Road. That's just Jackson north. Road, right? Yeah. Wait, this this okay. last one? Is I'm confused. Right? Yep. Is this the one by the Comptroll? Is that just that? Yes, yes. It's just south of it. Actually. Just south of it. Yeah, literally south. ETJ, uh, for recorded, first up, we have Comar. Uh, this is a one-lot commercial, just under two acres on the expressway between Benson and Ware. Uh, Dale Shine at Business 83, not oh Dale God. Shine, uh, which is Business 83 and 23rd, uh, one-lot commercial. It's the car wash place. Uh, Geppetto Meadows in the ETJ, one-lot residential. It is for a single-family home, just uh, over two and a half acres. Uh, that's on Eubanks. Macias Torres on Ware and Francisca, um, one lot commercial, a quarter of an acre. And la no, not lastly, Sungate subdivision, which is 56 <coughs> lots of single family residential, uh, just to the southeast of Ware and Daffodil, just under 12 acres. And lastly, we have Vendome subdivision uh, between El Pacifico and uh, what's the other one? Russell, uh, 94 lots, 28 acres. These names are very creative. Hmm? <laughs> These names, the names? Are, <laughs> are very creative. Are y'all talking to DeSoto about annexing? We have brought it up. Um, they kind of politely ignored us. Uh, we'll try again. For annexing, is that what you said? Yeah, well, yeah it's a 10 lot. Residence. And it's just Southern underneath the uh, and it's, and there's compost. And it's around the, I mean, On Vendome, has the subdivision process already started? Incentivated. This one is already recorded, sir. Oh, Phase two, yes, sir. We to the sound, I think that's a uh, specific goal. Uh, yes. Subdivision liners. They have a walking hiking oh, bike trail, don't they? Correct. Is yeah, Vendom also going to do the same thing? Mm -hmm. No. Thank you. Hmm. Is math here? The math is always wrong. 65 subdivision, not 60. And he doesn't do year. You know. It's a differential equation. <laughs> <laughs> it's my last official meeting. Rule number 11. Yeah. What's wrong? Hey, you're, you're met, you'd have 65 subdivisions in blue year, for year to date. Yeah, not 60 up. if you add them up. And so. And then it'd be nice if you actually did year to date. I know because the full year in 1920, but we decided to compare year to date when you use a full year for 1920 and only six months for 2021. Right. Mayor, Commissioners, Roy, uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> give me a status report update on parks projects. Um, first project here is the Rotoma Place System. This is a CDBG uh, funded project. Um, Park Place will come and install. Uh, parks uh, staff will do the uh, the fall zone and then come back in after the installation with the wood fiber for the floor and surface. Second photo here is the completion of the Yavalde ball field lighting, uh, another CDBG funding uh, project. I believe the uh, the team completed this the lighting portion of this project Thursday or Friday right before the storm. Uh, we did get a pretty good photo of uh, the lights on when the storm was coming and hopefully we can give that in the next uh, status report. Uh, pending on this project is bringing in the topsoil, uh, realigning the irrigation, uh, minor adjustment on the irrigation, and then coming back in and hydro seeding uh, the fields. Are we, adding, um, are we adding some of the trees that we're relocating to this park? Right now we have relocated at Springfest, La Floresta, and at Municipal Park. 
but we can look into options of doing that as well. Yeah, just because on this one we need shading. Correct. I, I had a question on the phone. Uh, I noticed a couple parts right near at the end of the slides. The foam is um, whatever that's put, put. Is there a way you could cut it out and put new foam there instead of doing the whole the whole play area? So the, the the wood fiber. Are you talking about the wood fiber, the flooring spacing on the playground? No, I'm talking about the, the little foam rubber that you got that in. Land on? Huh? That they land on. Yeah, they, they land on. But the whole park's like that. The whole play area is like that. Surrounded by that rubber. Yeah, like at, at Fireman's Park, for instance. And it's right near the where the slide ends, that's where right. our kids get off right. the slide. And so those are always damaged, but the rest of the park's good. Instead of replacing the whole foam area, can you just do cut off the landing the area? Cut off. For the we slide can we can look at that and, and yeah. see what we can do to improve that patch on the slide. Patch it. Yeah. Seems to me, it could patch it. Wonder if we would. But I remember Mike had a discussion about that a year or two ago. That that product doesn't do very well. Yeah. yeah the the pour in place, the foam, uh, just due to the heat yeah. um, and the right. elements down here. Uh, that doesn't do very well in our in our conditions, um, and so then we look at the wood fiber. Uh, you have to replace the whole thing though with the other one. Correct. Yes. Correct. Wow. So have you found something uh, better? Yeah. We we haven't looked at what we could bring in as far as the pour in place or the soft foam. Um, this wood fiber is in most of our parks um, and does a pretty well job of, of help cushioning uh, if a child does fall uh, from a play strap or a swing set. Uh, impact. Uh, is, that is what, what did you put in uh, La Vista? La Vista, we're going to go with wood fiber there as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that one will be coming up here in the next uh, slide or two. Um, this photo here is uh, for Suarez Toddler Play System, another CBD, uh, CDBG fund. Um, this will have the same floor, uh, or the same flooring um, coming in. Oh, yeah. The vendor will install the canopies, the play deck, uh, the slides. Um, and so we hope to have this one completed by uh, the end of summer. I know it says April 21, but uh, we're a little behind um, on that. Here's La Vista uh, play system. This is from Parkland Zone 2 funding. Um, and so this will be replacing the existing structure there at, at La Vista with the wood fiber. Um, again, vendor will come and install. Uh, we'll do the uh, maintenance on the fall zone um, and then placing the wood fiber down. As you can see, there's a trend here. Uh, if you haven't noticed the past couple of slides, it's uh, no more restrooms. It is play structures. So. Oh, I got a suggestion for one, though. For the Fireman's Park, instead of building an H2O hunt, yeah, like you get it, put a bathroom in, it's actually cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were actually looking at a pre-built, prefab, yes, pre building. <laughs> um, right. This photo here, La Flodesta Park. Uh, Lands, uh, Parkland Zone 3 funding. Here are some of the trees, Commissioner, that we uh, transplanted. Trees are um, 180,000. Like you're not going to play on them. Just look at them. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the trees that we've replanted uh, and, and transported uh, to La Floresta, like I mentioned Bless before. You. Bless you. Oh, thank you. Bless you. Uh, Muni Park, 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 uh, Park. Uh, La Floresta and Spring Fest, where we transplanted. Well, this is over there by Freddie Gonzalez and 23rd, where Irrigation District Number 1 crosses 23rd. Okay, but the, the budget included the one of the big trail relocation. Right. Uh, at La Floresta? Yes. A trail sidewalk, uh, park, and picnic benches there. Well, we're going to siphon the water from the irrigation district there? Correct, yes, sir. We still got to get with the irrigation district on that. We do have the pump uh, to see where we can connect them to the, the canal. We get the, uh, but what are we doing with this structure? Yeah. I'm learning. Um, which one? This, the, oh, the next one, sorry. We're not oh, this one. Right. This one is the uh, Fireman's Park H2O hut. So after uh, University Draft House took the land, purchased the land from the city, we had to relocate our H2O hut, which was right there um, at the University Draft House near the back patio. Mm -hmm. So we purchased a uh, military container um, and gonna con is going to convert that one into our new H2O hut, which will sit on the northeast side of the lake. Um, to where we can house our kayaks, paddle boats. Behind the kitchen? North of the kitchen? North of the kitchen? Uh huh. Um, south of the restroom. Food? South of the restroom. We're, we're <laughs> bringing back restroom. South of the restroom on the east side of the lake. Oh. And so I believe in previous uh, status update reports, we've given the layout on right. that map. Next uh, report, I can bring that map back. Okay. Ensure the location on that. The parking's going to be a problem. Right. Oh. And that concludes my report. Any questions? Yeah, uh, no, was fast. Where? Because I know we're leaving the restrooms behind. But, <laughs> but to bring a restroom, where are we on the restroom for Spring Fest? 
Spring Fest, we are uh, rolling over the monies um, for next fiscal year, uh, but that is uh, number one priority on our list to get that uh, facility up and going. Okay. Let's see if we can roll it for this year. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> any questions? Okay. Any other questions? No. Then uh, we don't have any uh, Thank people you. for public comment, so we'll adjourn the workshop and convene the work city commission. In the This concludes the workshop of the McAllen City Commission. Workshops are held every second and fourth Monday of the month, convening at 4 p.m. at the McAllen City Commission Chamber on the third floor at McAllen City Hall. Avoid colonias developing, which are neighborhoods without the required water and sewer infrastructure, among other requirements. Commissioners also approved an ordinance to allow for a $250 administrative fee for variance applications under the City of McAllen subdivision ordinance for staff time and other related costs. Currently, there is no fee in place and engineers would request variances before work began. Under the manager's report, City Engineer Yvette Barrera gave the staff recommendation on the Schneider project, which was